<coughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak tonight. Uh, as you probably figured out, I'm not one of the hepatologists here, although I, my affiliation with the Liver Unit goes back a long way. I was a, a research fellow uh, when the Liver Unit first opened in the mid-90s, and my first ever clinical research was on liver disease to do with hepatic uh, uh, encephalopathy before and after a liver transplant. And I, I work closely with the hepatologists and liver surgeons because my main interest is um, really is the pancreas and the biliary tree, obviously, which is part of the liver, but I do spend a lot of time doing endoscopy, doing advanced endoscopy. And so what I've been asked to talk about is really focusing on some of the advances in endoscopy and liver disease, uh, mostly be sh showing some uh, images, so if we're able to get the lights down a little bit, we might help yeah. because it, it'll, it'll, some of the pictures will, will project better. So, I'll start off really talking about gastroscopy, talking about the, probably what is the most common endoscopic uh, procedure for patients with liver disease, because with a gastroscope put down into the esophagus, you're able to identify esophageal viruses, which are obviously a concern when uh, someone has cirrhosis and over a long period of time there's a high risk of developing uh, cirrhosis which is why endoscopy, when somebody first has a diagnosis of cirrhosis an endoscopy is normally done to assess whether uh, viruses have developed and the risk of bleeding we know relates not just to the severity of the liver disease but also to the size of the viruses and something I'll come back late to later, the portal pressure which is obviously the abnormal pressure that develops because of the liver disease and the blood flow not being able to, to go through the liver and having to find its way through other means to get back to the uh, superior vena cava. So you end up with small vessels in the esophagus which weren't meant to deal with this uh, flow of blood becoming enlarged and then that, that leads to the pressure problems with varices. The standard treatment of uh, varices uh, involves endoscopy. It used to be very common due down to injection of a sclerosin, which basically just irritated the vessel and caused the vessel to sort of uh, to, to, to fibrose and block off. You can also inject glue, uh, you can inject thrombin, which is an agent that promotes clotting to, to form. But the, the most common way of treating varices endoscopically is to put a, a little band on. And I've got a video clip to show you. And we also know that endoscopic banding can have a role in primary prevention. So this is the, the first bit I talked about was really if you if a, a, the viruses bleed, how do you treat them, and then how do you go on to, to, to eradicate them? You do further banding after the initial treatment, but there's also evidence that when viruses are first identified, it's a, it's a good idea to try and prevent them uh, becoming a problem. And in that scenario, Normally it's with medication, with beta blockers, but some people can't tolerate beta blockers and then in that situation you might consider banding. So this is just to, to, sh to give an idea of what happened. So this is, if I can get my mouse to work, uh, I don't think it's showing, but on the far left you've got the, the end of the, the endoscope and there's a little clear plastic sort of cap that's fitted over and you can see for about five or six blue rubber bands that are around the tip of the instrument and then what happens is in the middle image there when the instrument is put down that cap is put over where the the, the, the varice, varix is suctions applied which sucks it up into the cap and then there's a uh, there's basically just a, a pulley system you, you turn a knob on the endoscope and that the, the, the rubber band closest to the end is pulled off and then goes over the the varics as you can see in the picture on the on the right and this if I can get this to work we'll just show uh, a video oops so I uh, hope nobody feels too squeamish but there's a little bit of blood in the esophagus uh, going down and uh, you can just see the top right hand, there was, uh, let's see, if it's the, so I'll just play this one, so you've got, it'll, it'll freeze in a minute and just to the right, there is just, there's no longer bleeding, but about three o'clock there's a, a visible bulge there and that was the area that had been bleeding, so now the attachment's been put on the end of the, the scope, that's put down, it's put over the, the area that's been bleeding where the varix is, you just there, the suction's applied, that brings it up and then you release the, the rubber band and when you pull back you can just see the rubber band over it and basically you repeat that 
uh, going round sort of in a, a helical, as you pull back, putting bands on, on the uh, other sides. And that's been shown to be very effective in stopping the active bleeding. And then what you do is you probably bring the individual back in about a month's time. But those bands fall off. You sometimes get a little ulcer there, but they fall off. But they've blocked off that vessel, but you repeat it usually somewhere between two and four times at a monthly interval till you've got rid of them completely. And that, that can be very effective and is the standard way of dealing with uh, var bleeding varices uh, currently. What I wanted to talk about now is a procedure that you may have heard of. It's got a very sort of long name, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, but it's known by the acronym ERCP. And it's basically an endoscopic procedure. Obviously, these are all done with the individual heavily sedated or sometimes under general anaesthetic, uh, fasted so the stomach's empty, and the instrument's put down through the stomach into the duodenum where the bile duct actually opens out. And in that position, you get a view of the, the opening of the bile duct, and you can pass a fine instrument into the bile duct, and you can then put dye in, x-ray dye, and take an x-ray picture, and I'll show you some images. And it has lots of uses. We do probably about 900 such procedures in the Freeman each year. Uh, it's the most common way of removing stones from the bile duct. You can also obtain biopsies, and you can put stents into the biliary tree, pancreatic duct, you use it to uh, examine patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis. And a recent innovation, which we've been at the forefront of using over the last seven years is actually a, a, basically a second tiny scope that's only a few millimeters large that goes down a channel in the main scope and again I'll show you a, a, an animation and some images and that goes through the main instrument and you can then pass that into the bile duct and you get a, an image from the bile duct on the second screen so sometimes when we do these procedures you have three or four screens one for the x-ray one for the endoscopic image another one for the image inside the bile duct and there's another device I'll show you that we can use to actually do live microscopy within the bile duct that we sometimes do as well. And this is just to show the... Uh, for some reason the mouse isn't moving around on the screen, but on the left hand side that's just showing sort of a cartoon. You can see the, the, the scope of sort of the black tube coming down and positioning uh, just here. So that's the scope, that's positioning and the opening of the bile duct, bile duct up there, obviously liver up there. And this shows the sort of same thing with the x-ray that you take when we've injected the dye. So the dye is filling up in the bile duct, filling into the liver, uh, and you can identify any narrowing, uh, any stones, any... Uh, 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 the gallbladder is actually filling there, there's probably a few stones in there, and that's the pancreatic gun. Uh, this next image, this is showing you. So that's the business end of the uh, duodenoscope. It's a side viewer, so you don't actually see out the bottom, you're seeing out to the side so that you can actually see where the opening is. So on that cartoon you can see there's a stone in the bile duct on that cutaway image and this is a live video showing the fine instrument that has to be then manipulated into the opening of the bile duct, which can sometimes be very awkward. That's just been put into the opening there. Uh, and then a little cut is made uh, using a current through the wire to actually open up the bottom of the bile duct so that a, a stone can be uh, pulled out. And this is one of the most common, there's about, as I said, we do about 900 of these procedures a year, not all for stones, but then that shows what you then do. So there's a stone in the bottom of the bile duct that a balloon device is put up into the bile duct, deflated, and then when it's inflated, you can then pull back down and you can see a little stone that's just fallen out on the right-hand side there. And that's just showing you how that's done. So the stone gets inflated and then when you pull back down, you can pull the stone out. So it's a you know, day case procedure. It uh, all goes well. The, the individual can go back home a bit later on when they've come around from the sedative. In terms of dealing with strictures, which are narrowing in the bile duct, uh, endoscopy using that instrument I showed the DRCP has a, a, a big role we sort of support the liver transplant service in that uh, as I'm sure you're aware sometimes after a transplant there's a bile leak uh, uh, and often rather than reoperating we're asked to put a little stent often a thin plastic tube in through the bile duct up into the liver and then that allows bile to drain out and allows the leak to heal 
sometimes there's a, a narrowing of the, of the anastomosis where the donor liver and the and the, uh, the recipient bile duct have been stitched together. They can sort of narrow down, and again in that situation we can do a procedure and put a stent in to uh, allow that to drain better. What we tend to use increasingly is, as you can imagine, there's a limit to the size of what you can put down the channel of the instrument, but we there are these metal mesh stents, and I'll, I'll show you a, a video of one, which go down constrained, so they're quite narrow, but when it's released, it opens out uh, bigger than obviously the size it goes down, and that gives even better drainage. And for patients with PSC, in certain situations, the strictures can be treated with a, putting a device up and inflating a balloon to, to, to uh, open up the stricture, or again, stents can be put in. So. So this is, I'll just stop this and show you, so this is the x-ray on the left hand side and this is the endoscopic image looking from here, so the image that you'd see from the, 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 the uh, video chip here and that's the x-ray with some contrast. That device is the stent device which has started to be released and you can see it opening up there and as it's released you'll see it flaring up all the way down and eventually you'll see the metal uh, barbs on the end of the stent and in the, in the uh, duodenum there. Just up again. So you can see that it's releasing, it's opening up and if there's a narrowing there this is opening up, pushing out against that and on the bottom right hand side you can see it eventually opening into the, into the uh, into the, the small bowel and you'll see some bowel flowing and again that is a, is a day case procedure that can be you know, done once you get access it can be done quite quickly uh, and would help and if it's a say it's a, a stricture due to uh, uh, as I said uh, the, after a liver transplant you could probably put one of these stents leave them for about six months to a year uh, as you can see it's got the sort of a, a prominent loop there it's covered so it doesn't become embedded so you can go back down, grab it and pull it out and hopefully the, the area that was narrowed has now been opened up and will stay uh, opened up. Sometimes you have to put another one in and, and do that a few times. So turning to <coughs> another instrument, another technique <coughs> used, which is endoscopic <coughs> ultrasound. So this is combining the endoscope uh, with ultrasound. So this is what the sort of instrument that we use. So the, the optical bit is here, so you get a view coming out that way, and that little sort of uh, prominence there is actually an ultrasound transducer, so when you put the, the instrument down into the stomach uh, or into the small bowel, you're actually then on a different screen, scanning, looking through into the structures in the abdomen, so you can examine the liver from there, the bile ducts, we use it to see if there are any little stones that have been missed on other scans. Because you're putting the ultrasound inside the body, you get a much better picture than you can from outside and in certain circumstances it's a better resolution than you can get with CT or with MR uh, and because it's got a channel on this instrument you can see there's a needle coming out so you can actually uh, take biopsies, you can do interventions, you can drain uh, collections uh, and as I'll show you later one of the new techniques that's been developed is actually to measure the portal pressure in, in uh, patients with liver disease and that, that is very, ex and I'll, I'll discuss it in more detail, that's at a very early stage when I can envisage in you know, the next five years or maybe a bit longer it will be a, a technique that's used much more commonly. Uh, this is just me with uh, Richard Charlie who's one of the uh, uh, sort of not, not a transplant surgeon, one of the liver and pancreatic surgeons who just recently retired, who I've worked closely with over the years, and that's just looking at the screen of the one of the ultrasound machines, just to give you an idea of the setup uh, that we use. And with the ultra endoscopic ultrasound, there's lot there are various techniques. We can inject contrast, which is not the same as the contrast you get with an X-ray, but one that picks out fine flow in blood vessels. And as I said, you can take samples. Of, uh, of tissue. This, just to demonstrate the sort of uh, image quality, this on the top left hand, it's a black and white image, this is actually the bile duct, so the bile duct normally just measures about you know, three or four millimeters across, if it's, if it's blocked it can get bigger, but this is a bile duct that you can see is, is a bit thickened, normally you wouldn't see that it's just a very thin wall but actually it's thickened with a, with a narrowing so actually there's a stricture there, the, the portal vein is just behind there. So this is with the instrument put into the, into the duodenum looking up underneath the liver uh, and 
I'll just play that just to show that you can get a very, you know, literally the scale on this side is a centimetre, so that's just a centimetre, so you actually, you are able to see to a, a, a very, a very small structure, and that's actually a needle coming out of the instrument to take a biopsy from the wall there, so that's just about two or three millimetres depth, so you can actually sample very small areas. <coughs> and you just see the needle, which is the white line, moving in and out to get a sample from the, from the bile duct to make a diagnosis as to what's going on. And because of the nature, you, you, you know, this is done under deep sedation, but you, you know, the, the, the pain fibers in the abdomen aren't the same as you be in the skin, so you know, you don't feel this, uh, the, the patients are, you know, are just sort of resting and, and sleepy while this is, is being done. Turning to, I mentioned about uh, being able to put another scope down, the main scope, so cholangioscopy uh, is another term for actually doing endoscopy inside the bile duct. And this is something, again, we've been at the, the forefront of. And so this is the original system, and we were one of the first in the country to have this. And what you're seeing here is, that's the standard duodenoscope, that's the instrument that I've shown you before going down. And what happens is you, you attach this, which is basically it was a single-use disposable tiny scope onto the side. It's got its own controls. That's the tip of it. It goes down the channel there, will come out the end, and you can control it from here and move it sort of left, right, up and down. The original one, you had to put a fiber optic down uh, the middle of it, uh, and the image quality wasn't brilliant. Uh, but I'll just, just to give it just a little, this just shows a demonstration. Uh, Play. Yeah, yeah, so I think it's just showing how you attach it. The, the probe comes out the end, but, and the biopsy forceps can go down the other channel. And this is what we use probably for about six or seven years, and it's in the last 18 months or so been superseded by an instrument that has got a video chip built into the end of it and is single use. It's, it's very quite expensive, it's about £2,000 a pop to use one of those. Uh, so it's obviously used in very special circumstances, but it means you can do examinations that you couldn't ordinarily do uh, that might have involved surgery or may possibly even just impossible to have done otherwise. And that's just showing an example of how the instrument is passed down and wh where it's positioned. <clears throat> bottom uh, image is just showing you a view, sort of stop working in, and that's supposed to be a, a view down the instrument, and, and because it was a fiber optics <coughs> instrument, the views weren't brilliant, but you could get views, you could get biopsies, but this has been, we have much better equipment now, so this is the current one that we use, so uh, it's basically, the, 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 uh, you don't have to put a fiber optic down, it's a single use device that attaches onto the side of the the main scope and you know there's only a few units in the country using them certainly we're the only ones in the, the region with this instrument uh, and it allows us as I'll show you to to do very detailed examinations in the bile duct up into the liver even that you know, couldn't have been done previously can I ask you a question has it got a light source on the it uh, does yes it doesn't show but it's on the end of it it's got two light sources yes. as well as the video chip and then a channel for irrigation and it's you can control it up or down as you can see it shows it moving and it's literally just you know uh, it's three four millimeters uh, diameter and that's just showing some irrigation and this is it's not one of my videos but this is a, a video showing so that's the that's a balloon device being put because I'll just stop that and then explain so uh, the patient had a narrowing, a stricture in the bile duct that hadn't been diagnosed, so uh, a balloon device has been put up which is then inflated to open up the stricture and then that device is then going to be put up, and I'll show you the video, to have a look inside and get some biopsies. Stop. 
So the balloon's inflated and you'll, it'll then show you the balloon at the bottom. So that's about probably five, six millimeters across. That's the end of the business end of the, the cholangioscope, it's called the spy scope, and that's the view inside the bile duct. So you're actually looking, you can see the little openings there are up, either the opening into the bile, into the gallbladder, <coughs> or opening up into the branches inside the liver, and you get a very detailed view, sort of image, well, certainly this quality image just wasn't available as readily as this uh, up until just a couple of years ago, and at the bottom, you can see it's a biopsy, tiny little biopsy forceps, there's a bit of bleeding because that's been put in and, and some pinch biopsies are being taken. But that then allows you to, to make a diagnosis as to, to what's going on. So it's single use, uh, as I said it's expensive, but it, it, in the right uh, circumstances is invaluable. Um, this is actually a video uh, of a procedure I've done. Which, just show some st some stones, which you can see the little fragments there, and also an area, a sort of irregular area at the top. We'll be able to get views of this that <coughs> haven't been very well seen on external imaging, and then we'll obviously take biopsies as well as get rid of the stones uh, that we came across. And we've also looked into and published on being able to do the endoscopic ultrasound that I described earlier, which is less invasive, you're not putting anything into the bowel duct, yes you can put a needle to take samples but you can scan from internally get detailed views of the, the base of the liver, the vessels, the bile duct and then if necessary if you've ident identified a, a stone or a, a narrowing can then take that instrument out and put the ERCP scope down and do a spyglass or do an ERCP and we've shown that and published that it's safe to do both at the same time. It's probably preferable to do it under general anaesthetic because then obviously uh, because the, the patient's more relaxed and in a controlled environment because the procedures can take over an hour, sometimes an hour and a half or, or longer to do if you're doing two of them at the same time. So the other technique, which again is, this is even more specialized and there's only uh, probably ourselves or maybe one other unit in the country that's using this in this particular way but basically it's a very fine probe that can go down the well, go, it can go through a needle or can go through that cholangioscope that I showed going into the bile duct and it's basically a laser uh, microscope so you're putting a very fine uh, wire or device almost which is a tiny microscope so you can put it through the bile, through the uh, device and actually do a live microscopy inside the bile duct and actually get images from the bile duct. It is so new that it's still being sort of validated because the, the, you're seeing appearances that we've never had before uh, but it can be useful uh, and there are certain appearances that we know are associated with certain conditions so you have to, the, the, the actual probe is only a one millimeter in, in uh, uh, diameter so it's very very fine uh, and I'll show you that's the stack I'm very fortunate that the League of Friends actually uh, bought this uh, for me for the trust uh, about uh, two years back uh, and we use it uh, to look at back, uh, uh, strictures that are sort of not being diagnosed in any other way and I'll just show how you can use endoscopic ultrasound, ERCP, spy scope and the confocal laser in microscopy this probably isn't going to project very well but this is an endoscopic ultrasound image of a very thickened bile duct that's the uh, contrast agent which is the fine bubbles that are picked up by uh, small blood vessels and when the ultrasound uh, is on them, if, if there's a lot of blood flow, you get this very sort of bright appearance uh, which suggests inflammation and that's what we were seeing there. That's the, the bile duct with a very thickened wall and that image suggested that it's very inflamed. Uh, that was the X corresponding cholangiogram, very irregular bile duct and uh, this shows doing all of those procedures so the uh, so that's the x-ray appearance, that's some uh, uh, contrast in the gallbladder. This is the appearance in the bile duct where the, the, the walls of the bile duct just look very inflamed and swollen, almost like sort of pillow is just pushing in on the, on the, on the, uh, the, the lumen. And then the bottom left hand is the tiny the microscope that I mentioned being put into the bile duct. You start to see it will be flashing blue, which is the, the laser light 
to actually examine the bile duct wall. Uh, and then, is it doing it? <coughs> see a bit of flashing. And then, see, yeah, there we are. So that's doing the examination. Uh, and that's just, a, it, it, it looks like it's a flame or something. It's not, it's just the, the, the reflected light. There is, uh, there's no trauma from that. And then, if this will play that, that's the view that you get, the microscopic image that you get on a screen from that uh, bottom left hand corner and it can be difficult to interpret but there are certain patterns that you can see uh, and, and it again it's you know very spe specialized circumstances that can be helpful. So a lot of that that I showed you is very advanced, not, wide, not widely available outside a few centres in the UK. What I'm going to talk about now is something that's on the horizon. Uh, I think it could have a, a big role in the future. It's something that actually uh, live at, I had some funding a couple of years ago and Livernorth were very supportive of my application to the university and helped to, uh, to secure the funding to actually do a study to look into this. But for one reason or another, the company who were making the device at the last minute decided that <clears throat> they didn't want to let us have the device, which stopped me doing the research, but we are getting involved in other ways, and I'll just sort of uh, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about it. The next few slides I'll show are actually from this group in, in California who've done uh, some of this work, and basically we would started off talking about varices, you know, the large vessels in the, in the gullet, this is because of the condition of portal hypertension, where you get a, a backflow because the liver is damaged and fibrosed, you've got a backflow of blood, and it's known that that particular measurement, the hepatic venous pressure gradient, is a very good way of deter telling how bad the portal hypertension is, and is, is known to be the single best prognostic factor in terms of deciding the potential course of disease. The problem with it is it's not easily uh, achieved. So what normally happens, and it's done by the interventional radiologists here, but you have to put a, you want to get, you want to basically measure pressure in the liver. So the radiologist is putting a special catheter either through the vein, through an uh, vein in the arm, through the neck or the groin, up until it comes into the liver, and you end up with this catheter in the a branch of hepatic vein in the liver and you're basically looking to measure the difference the gradient between blood that's flowing in through the portal vein and the pressure flowing out because you've got the resistance there and what they do is they they measure the pressure with a balloon down and you get a certain measurement you inflate the balloon and that pressure you get is reflects the resistance across the liver and and it can be done but it's a bit involved and it's not done routinely for that reason. <clears throat> but it's known that you know, it's a measurement that is very, very helpful to have. And what this team did, uh, their initial approach was, well, as I explained to you, when you put the uh, echo endoscope down, you're, you're using ultrasound. When the instrument's in the, bottom, in the esophagus or just into the stomach, you've got very good views of the liver. And they said, well, why can't we put a needle through the liver into those vessels and actually measure the pressure directly. And so the first study they did was actually in an animal model. I think they did it in pigs and they showed that actually they got, and they, at the same time, they also measured the pressure the normal way by that balloon that I described and they found there's a very good correlation. You know, it's that, that, that you got that line going at sort of 45 degrees, which shows basically the two pressure measurements uh, correlated very well. And they have gone on to do a small study, the first study published in humans, in patients who had uh, liver disease, and uh, they basically, this is the, the device that they use, it's a very simple device uh, there that's showing the pressure reading, and it attaches onto the end of a needle that is then goes through, a flexible needle that can go through the, the channel of the instrument, and it's a needle we use to take biopsies from, uh, it's relatively inexpensive, and what they're showing here is that uh, we just so the first picture shows that's the echo endoscope coming down, that's the needle going out into the hepatic vein, uh, which is, if you remember, is where the balloon device was when it's measured the other way. So it goes into there, you you measure the pressure, 
needles pulled out, then the needles put into the portal vein there, you measure the pressure, and then you can obviously subtract one from the other. And this is just to show you what you see on the endoscopic ultrasound. So that's the liver, We're just, you're just seeing that's all liver there, that's the end of the instrument, and that's, you can measure the wave using that in the uh, hepatic vein, and then you'll see there's the needle coming down, so the needle's used to puncture into the vessel. And obviously the concern is, well, aren't you going to cause bleeding by putting this needle through the liver? And interestingly, you know, they've done this study on 20-odd uh, uh, patients, and they didn't have any complication, is what they report. So that was just going into the, the hepatic vein, and then this, I think, uh, I got the right one, then, then the, the needle comes out and goes into the portal vein. And so, as I said, they've done 24 cases, you know, a variety of uh, causes of the liver disease. Uh, some of the patients were known to have uh, varices, and they showed 100% technical success. They were able to identify and put the needle into the vessels. They got the pressure measurement, and there were no complications. And what they showed here is that there was a difference in, so patients who had what they called high risk, so more severe cirrhosis, had the higher pressures measured versus those who had low risk. If you had varices, your pressure was higher than those who didn't. And if they had portal hypertensive gastropathy, which is a sort of inflammatory change you can get in the stomach uh, because of uh, portal hypertension, again, in that setting, <coughs> uh, there, there, there was a significant pressure difference. So this is, I think, very exciting. It's still very, very early days. Uh, I think we're hoping to get involved with some of the further work that's been done to validate this, but it, it does mean potentially a much simpler way of measuring the, that pressure, important pressure, which can help uh, in, in future treatment, even in possibly an assessment of response. If it, if it turns out to be as safe as they're suggesting, so that you're more prepared to do it, you can envisage somebody being on treatment, say to reduce the pressure, and you can do a quick measurement to see whether it's working, because we know that you, some people go on to a medication at a certain dose and it reduces the pressure, others need different medications, and you can actually measure that pressure uh, potentially. But uh, I think we're a little way from being able to, to do that uh, routinely. And they concluded that it was, a, uh, it was safe and feasible. Uh, so, and again, that's their conclusions I've just said of the potential for this. So, as a conclusion to my talk overall, I th hopefully I've persuaded you that endoscopy has a, an, a very much established role in the diagnosis and therapy of liver disease. It's the, you know, a very important um, means of diagnosing and treating esophageal varices, dealing with biliary strictures, that colangioscopy, putting the instrument into the bowel duct and having a look, has got an important role in centres such as this in diagnosing narrowing strictures and that last uh, bit I mentioned about measuring the portal pressure potentially has huge potential. I think it's, it's, it's very early but if it, if it, if it uh, goes through as it looks like it might then I think we'll have a very important new uh, tool to help patients with liver disease. Thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be some questions, <laughs> but I'll start. Um, the, uh, the, the, the guided portal um, pressure measure, yes. is, it, is it more accurate than the balloon system? Where That's you... a very good question. So I think the first study that needs to be done, they've obviously, they said it did in animals, but the study that needs to be done is to make that measurement, because in some ways you would think it would be, but obviously a lot of the literature and, and and treatment that's done currently is based on certain values through the standard balloon. So what we really need is studies comparing the two, so we can say, well, you know, if it's five on one, that's equivalent to ten on the other, or they're both exactly the same. So that is a study that needs to be done before it's, it's used routinely, and, and I think those that, that's the studies that are underway at the moment. And it must be less traumatic for uh, if you're not going to block off the floor of the portal vein. Well, it's it's funny because. You'd say yes and no because the, I mean the, the interventional radiologists are very skilled. You know, if you puncture into the, the neck, that's the point where you go in. So they're not puncturing anything else internally. They're just following the vessel. So if there's bleeding, you can put pressure on there. The worry, which hasn't been substantiated, is if you've got an instrument and you put a make a 
puncture into the liver and it starts bleeding. You're not able to control it as readily internally, which is why you know, this has been thought of over the last 20 years, but nobody's actually taken it to this stage because there was a thought, well, it's going to bleed, isn't it? But it, it doesn't appear to because whilst you're trying to measure elevated pressure, it's still quite a low pressure. It's not the same, you know, that the, our blood pressure is around, you know, 120, whereas a blood pressure in the portal vein, normal pressure is 3 or 5, and a high pressure is 12. So it's, it's quite a low pressure system, and it seems that it doesn't actually bleed that much. Or, so, so, but but the, the potential advantage is you can do it so quickly. If it works, you're literally, you're having a look, yes, there's viruses there, let's just measure the pressure, pop that in, 20 seconds, bring it out, find the other vessel, pop it in, measure it, you're done. So it's the potential to be able to do it much more, you know, readily if it, if it turns out to be safe and, and correlates with the other one. Well, <coughs> I've got a long history of uh, uh, liver disease, but my last uh, uh, biopsy, which was last May, that shows I have a fibrosis, and the consultant told me that there's a new treatment for it. So, is there anything to think about? Right, so, well, you give me anything or I, 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 the right I, one? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think who's your consultant? They're probably the, the yeah. right person to, to speak yeah, to. Yeah. Did you say? Oh, we do. Was it here? Uh, yeah. Was it Stuart McPherson? Yes, that's Stuart right. Yeah. Yeah. Stuart's a very, uh, as I explained at the beginning, my speciality is in the endoscopy side. I'm, I'm, not, a, a, I'm not a hematologist, so I, I'm, I'm, I couldn't give you any better advice than he could. That's for sure. Well, we can ask Stuart that question. Oh, yeah. If you, can you sample, if you're looking at both the patty vein and the portal vein, yeah. if you're, is it possible to sample the input to the liver from the gut and the portal vein yeah. and the hepatic vein yeah. directly? Would that be a more accurate way of looking at certain blood chemistries to look at how well the liver is actually functioning? Yeah, again, a very it, accurate. Yeah, I mean, again, that's a very interesting question, a very interesting thought, because as you say, certainly for certain drugs, you know, that it's coming in from the gut at the liver and the portal vein. And then you know what's happened to the concentration on the other side. So there are all sorts of potentials of putting a needle in. It, in it's easy to do, but currently we avoid trying to put the needle because we're worried about bleeding. But if these sorts of studies suggest that actually the risk is quite low, then I can see that again being something that is is done for research purposes and potentially ultimately has some implications for clinical management. That you can sample and, and measure drug levels before they get into the body, see what the liver does to the measure them on the outflow, but uh, we're, we're, we're very much at the beginning of that sort of investigation. When we, um, when we funded the RETA trials, there was um, a, lo a lot of um, innovation on the design of the wand and this, hmm. the, you know, and, and the fingers can come out the yes. end of the endoscope yes. and do all sorts of things yes. and take samples. You can actually do, um, apart from, uh, this is before the banding, it was the, um, they could actually um, uh, destroy a tumour, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with, um, but I mean, has there been any more developments on the, because I mean, they were about £600 a shot, these... Uh, For the Rita probes. The one. Yes, yeah. and to be honest, I know, I know that's something that the surgeons and sort of radiologists do, so I've not been involved mm -hmm. with that, mm -hmm. that work, but uh, as we were discussing before, the problem with a lot of these particularly new technologies is, you know, they're very expensive to develop, they're very expensive to manufacture, they're often low volume, so the companies that first bring them to market are in a position to charge a premium price. So a lot of the, the instruments and interventions I've described, they're not the, not the banding, because banding's been around for a long time, or the ERCP, removal of stones, and all of the, st the, the stents can be quite expensive, but the, the, the single-use cholangioscope and, you know, the confocal probe, all of those are very expensive. I was thinking about the removal of stones because it seems a bit, um, not a, no, it doesn't seem a surefire method to put a balloon behind it and then pull it out when you could grab it. Yeah, the, 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 we, you can, you're quite right, so the, you can put, the other devices we use are basically a basket that goes yeah, up and open, yeah. but the problem, the potential problem is what you don't want is you, you put, say, a basket in, grab the stone, 
and you know, like the monkey putting its yeah, hand into the, it. you can't get it out. So that can't happen. So the, the advantage of the balloon is, if it's not coming, you deflate the balloon, it comes out, yeah. and then you can do, you can enlarge the opening. So when you're sure of the size, then you know the, the, the basket's quite useful. But we also have baskets that are. Um, actually, what well, they call them mechanical lithotriptors, they, they, they're basket shaped but actually they'll crush the stone. So in that situation you can put one of those in and you, there's a crank and you just crush the stone and, and get it out that way. And what I didn't show you, using the, the kalangioscope, we, for, we get sent cases from around the region with very big stones, you know, two, three, four centimeter stones that you're never going to make an opening big enough to get them out. The baldock's just got very big. and you know, you, can, you could operate, but sometimes they're very risky patients, and actually the surgeons prefer us to, to deal with them by putting the kalangioscope down, and then there's a little, uh, what's called an electrohydraulic lithotriptor, which is basically a thin probe that goes through that kalangioscope. You can see the stone, and you basically you put, send shock pulse waves, or use a laser just to break the stone up, and then you can pull the bits of stone out. And then you don't, you don't, um, Sorry, no. you, you just drop them into the stuff, don't yes, you? Yes, that's yeah. right. Don't yeah. put, they, they just pass through, get yeah. yeah. digested. Excellent. What was the uh, piece of equipment that we bought for the markets? Mm. Yes, or Bounding endoscope. Was it? Yeah. yeah. Well, just, just, uh, right, that must be right at the beginning when uh, yeah, the only do one band. Yes, yes, there was a bag, you can only put one band at a time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think people are getting sick of it going up and down. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the first thing, the big thing. Yeah, right, no, no, right, yes, I'm talking about that. Well, I've just sent him the photographs, so if you see, yes, he's I'm very, right. very young on it. <laughs> you still had a beard, though. <laughs> yes, he's always had a beard on it, I've known him. <laughs> I'll put this on. Uh.